<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, today is the, the 10th of uh, June uh, 2022, and we'll talk about three architects uh, connected with the uh, with, uh, day of uh, June 10th. First, Antoni Gaudi, who died on, on, on June 10th. Uh, and uh, I will just present uh, an aspect of his work today, because um, this month as well, we'll also pay homage to him again on his very birthday. So today we'll talk, I sort of talking about Antoni Gaudi and ceramic tiles, because, because I think this is very important. And I think ceramic tiles uh, could play again a, a, an important role in, uh, in uh, contemporary architecture, because, because they are essentially earth, they are mud, they are clay. And, uh, and and clay uh, uh, should be uh, again uh, of, of uh, affectionate uh, interest to us, if indeed we are to build in a sustainable way, and also in a beautiful way. So the ceramic tiles in the work of Antoni Gaudi are extremely important. In fact, I would say without ceramic tiles, his work will simply not be the same. So again, today is the day, the 10th of June, he died on the 10th of June, and that's why uh, we talk about him today. But let's look at some, some works, some ceramic tiles. This is not a major uh, presentation on him. The major presentation on him will happen this month later on his birthday. Uh, but it is important, I think, to uh, especially considering he is one of the most important architects uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, not just the past, the present, and also the future, we cannot, we cannot stop learning from him, reflecting on him, and uh, meditating, yes, meditating on the, on the meaning of his work. What do we look at here? This is not an artwork. Well, it is an artwork, but it is also architecture. And uh, he employed fragments, at random, as you can see, it is an aleatory display of colorful, um, you know, uh, ceramics, which he employed in, 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 in various uh, ways in his work. And, um, you know, again, I think it is important to reconnect with the earth uh, and the ceramic tiles could have a significant role in this, to reconnect with color because color is life. Nobody wants to live in a black and white environment. Color is life. And, uh, and without color, I think life would be uh, severely damaged. Also uh, spontaneity, because this, you understand these fragments, ceramic tiles were not placed there based on a rigor, rigorous plan. I'm sure there were no drawings. This was done spontaneously by uh, craftsmen, uh, maybe who who was a, a partner, a collaborator, an important Catalan architect himself, uh, participated himself. And who knows, maybe even Antoni Gaudi, we don't know. But it is important to understand that it's possible to do significant architectural gestures, even without planning. Maybe you envision a certain strategy, a playful strategy, like in this case, but the result is magnificent. Why? Because this playfulness says yes to life, says yes to, to, to the beauty of, uh, of art. And uh, as such, it is an encouragement to, uh, to continue to live on this earth. And it's a very sustainable form of uh, of uh, creating now because you, you, you use fragments. I don't know, I don't, I imagine, I like to think that they didn't break plates specifically for this purpose. Maybe they found these fragments, I don't know. But even if they framed, they, they broke them, you know, it's much easier to produce a plate than to produce a building. Uh, this, um, you see uh, here there are unbroken plates actually, and this reminds me of the, the artworks of a, a well-known North American contemporary painter, uh, Julian Schnabel, who got inspired by Antoni Gaudi actually in Barcelona. Uh, again, what do we see here? We see art. 
we see color, we see exuberance, we see enthusiasm, we see the joy of creativity. And uh, I think we need this joy as much as we can. Uh, again, you know, this, this, uh, this frame could have been a beautiful abstract work, artwork. Well, it's part of a frag, it's, it's a fragment of a building by Antoni Gaudi. And, uh, you know, it makes you stop and it makes you perhaps smile, hopefully. Um, ceramic tiles were used in the past frequently in all cultures. Uh, uh, well, you know, the, in the Persian architecture, uh, tiles arrived at the, uh, the degree of, uh, uh, you know, uh, aesthetical sophistication uh, unsurpassed. You know, why is it that we don't use them any longer? Although certain people do use it. And I do have, and maybe by the way of this, I could have talked about architecture and clay because there are important architects today who uh, work again with ceramic tiles. But these are, uh, you know, fragments of, from the works of Antoni Gaudi. Aren't they beautiful? I think they are. And I think it's, it's, it's not really, uh, you know, just a subjective uh, statement coming from me. I think they are. And, and uh, you know, I get so tired of, you know, uh, white walls, white walls, white walls. Why white walls? Why? Why only white? You know, why can't we bring in playfulness into the works like this, you know? Don't we have plates as well? I think we do. But we forgot to be playful. We forgot to, to, to create with spontaneity. And, uh, and that's a great loss. Anyway, um, there is much to say, of course, about ceramics in the work of, um, of Antoni Gaudi. But I want to stress again the joy you can arrive at by allowing yourself to be spontaneous, to love uh, art, to love, um, uh, you know, exuberance, to love uh, uh, colors, and uh, playfulness is an important part of it. Uh, without playfulness, you cannot create. I don't think you can. You have to be exuberant. I'm particularly talking to students now. Be exuberant, be enthusiastic. But it's true, in order to be enthusiastic and to be, um, you know, exuberant, you must find joy in your work. And joy comes from adventure, from playfulness. If you just follow the rules, restrictive rules, I don't think you can create like this. No, no, and it, it, is, it is a great loss. This is my opinion, you know, because uh, Antoni Gaudi, who was not a good student, in fact, uh, he struggled and I understood when he finished his studies, you know, the, the leader of the school uh, told someone near him, uh, uh, this man is either a nut, I mean, he was talking about Antoni Gaudi or a genius. Well, it, 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 time proved that he was a genius. While uh, Antoni Gaudi told a friend, these people think that if they gave me this uh, diploma, they made, him, they made me an architect. He was made an architect by God. I know this may sound a little too exalted, but it's true. Anyway, uh, try to take pictures of your own projects or of ma so many buildings, you know, like a square meter or a square, uh, a square half a meter and so on of many walls that surround you and, and the walls that you conceive in your projects, you, the students of architecture. Can you find so much richness? I'm sure you don't even think about it. You only think about space, 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 and space again. And the walls are white. And why should they be white? Why? Uh, anyway, sorry, not all pictures are the great resolution. Again, this is just a, a little uh, you know, introduction to a vast theme, actually. Color, ceramic tiles, playfulness in architecture. And we can learn a lot, again, from Antoni Gaudi, who died tragically at 73, being hit by a tram car in Barcelona. Um, very sad. But he left something behind, didn't he? 
uh, he left behind uh, uh, a testimony about creativity, about the joy of, of, of creativity, and uh, about also the joy of being unconventional, being different, be different, be different, don't follow rules and regulations. Antoni Gaudi could not have followed rules and regulations. You follow the rules and regulations, you arrive at the same results other hundreds of uh, students arrive at, and you don't want that. No, you want something original, something that is yours, something where you pour your own soul into, your own talent, your own creativity, your own energy, your own enthusiasm. Learn from Antoni Gaudi and learn, learn from the best. He is one of the best, as you know. Anyway, ceramic tiles, broken, but they are not broken because the spirit of the one who employ them was not broken. You know, they are fragments, but they are brought together by an artistic will. And that artistic will matters very much so. Look at this. I mean, sorry to say, but in just one picture, in one fragment of one of his walls, we see so much more than all the white walls of our boring projects. That's the truth. Because how do we honor the richness of nature? How do we, do we honor the, the beautiful wings of a butterfly? How do we honor the tail of a peacock? How do we honor the beauty of flowers? How? With white walls. Okay, now we go to the second uh, presentation about a Dutch architect, uh, important, who built a lot of uh, important uh, um, cathedrals in uh, in uh, in the Netherlands. So let's uh, let's start talking about him. Joseph Kuipers, 1861-1949. Uh, his father was even more famous than him, Pierre Kuipers. But Joseph also left behind some remarkable works. So he was born in 1861 on the 10th of June. So Josephus Theodorus Johannes Kuipers, born on, the, on June 10th, 1861, and died in January 1949, was a Dutch architect primarily known for his Catholic churches. Uh, this was the man. I would say a beautiful man, uh, maybe a romantic man. Well, the Dutch are unbelievable in art in, and architecture. They have so many, many great artists and architects. It is just incredible. Uh, and they still do. So Kuiper's first design, a house in neo-Renaissance style. So remember, he was born in the 19th century. Uh, but look at this house. You know, and look at the look at the look at the handwriting. You know, at, at the top of the drawing. You know, of course, we don't have time to write like this. No, we don't have time for anything because we have to watch the latest show, um, HBO show. You know, some nonsense uh, soap opera or some uh, violent, uh, uh, you know, uh, crime story on our TVs. Yeah. Uh, but this building, you know, this building, which was built in, you know, in the 19th century is, 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 is still remarkable and uh, is still rich. I, I think this top part was, uh, it's possible, was, was uh, modified uh, later. Uh, I don't know. Let's look again at the drawing. But uh, yeah, there, there seems to be a difference. Nevertheless, it's a very rich uh, building. And, uh, you know, we, we will have a chance to compare it in a way with an apartment building built by Rob Creer uh, a little bit later. Anyway, again, these are architects we should know. Joseph Kuipers was an important architect, and we are going to see some formidable cathedrals that he built, cathedrals. Um, so what is this? A church, St. Urbanus, 1889-1891. Kuiper's first church is built in a mix of neo-Gothic and neo-Romanesque styles and has a big square tower at the crossing, similar to much of his father's later work, notably the St. Augustinus 
in name Megan, sorry, I don't know Dutch, deep quarry. The interior is one of the first examples of the use of brick in different colors. Again, color, color, uh, brick, again, it's clay. You know, you have ceramic tiles, you have broken uh, plates, you have brick with different colors. Apparently, Joseph Kuipers brought, uh, you know, inspired by, uh, uh, you know, especially architecture from Italy. Uh, he brought the, 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 the differently colored bricks into the church architecture that he built. But look at the building from the outside. Uh, uh, no one can deny that it is majestic. It is imposing. Um, it's not modernistic, of course. You know, this is a late 19th century building. But, you know, tourist or not tourist, we do have to acknowledge that its presence, it, 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 is a, it is a powerful building. And the interior, I don't know, it may, it's possible, I see some, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe damages done by uh, the passage of time, but it's still, I think, inspiring, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the craft of architecture, you know, uh, placing a brick above another brick, and yes, he was inspired by the neo-Gothic and by the neo-Romanesque, but still, it, it's an architecture that, uh, you know, has quality. I mean, look at this, you know. I don't think there is anyone who enters this building who would say, well, you know, this building leaves me cold. No, no, it cannot leave you cold. It doesn't matter, it's not modern. No, it's fine, it's a good building. Now, a cathedral in Harlem, uh, the, the, the Netherlands again. Uh, I mean, look, there is craft here. There is the joy of creativity. There is again color. There are various materials which are brought together with uh, with ardor, even with uh, a lot of care and uh, you know uh, the minuteness of seriousness. You know, look how how much richness is here just at the top of this tower. You know, aren't we tower, uh, tired of our flat, you know, uh, t uh, terraces, uh, our flat roofs? You know, look here, it's architecture, it's geometry, it's mathematics, it's art, it's, 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 it's about, the, you know, honoring life with, uh, with uh, works which are uh, full of meaning and beauty. Look here, you know, just in this detail, you know, how these bricks recede and, uh, you know, they create a, a crescendo, uh, you know, uh, towards this uh, top part of the building. It, this is an art. And for this, you need emotions, not calculations. Emotions, of course, you need uh, calculations too in order to build. But these calculations are almost like a, a second step. You start with the immeasurable, as Louis Kahn said. You start with the emotions, with the vision. Look at the building. I'm absolutely sure uh, this architect is not now, but uh, is he an architect or was he an architect we should ignore? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is a, a good building and uh, it's uh, more than 100 years old and it still stands and it has complexity, it has multiplicity in unity and it was built, designed, thought, imagined, dreamed, by Joseph Kuipers. I really don't think that there might be too many people in the world who might say that we don't like this building. No, I mean, you know, even if it's not necessarily in the style we like the most, if we, if we are to use the word style, this is still an impressive building. Uh, it doesn't matter. We use a black and white picture like this one or a colored one like the previous one. It still stands its ground, doesn't it? It's still a good building. And the interior is majestic. What else can we say? It's indeed the house of God. This is what the cathedral is supposed to be and is meant to be. Now, the ever inventive and iconoclastic, even Dutch, you see, they created here a bridge, you know, a modern addition. I don't know if it was temporary or not, 
But I like, I like this about the Dutch, you know, they are continuously experimenting. They are very open-minded. They are pragmatic, but they are also poetical. Bravo to them. Uh, to unite the, the old with the new, no? Well, uh, here it is. Uh, here it is without that bridge, but uh, the cathedral is impressive even without that bridge, isn't it? Joseph Kuipers. I don't know what well, this is in Amsterdam. Uh, I think some kind of a bank or some kind of, a, of a headquarters. But here again, we see the power of detail, artistic detail. You know, yes, it is crafted. Craftsmen built it, but it was envisioned, was uh, you know, imagined by an architect. Uh, and uh, what else can we say? It's really about beauty. Now, I mean, yes, this elevation is rather neoclassical. It's um, a little bit stern, but uh, I guess appropriate for the function it has. I think it has something to do with, with a bank, being a bank. But at the top, the bank becomes, uh, you know, exalted a little bit, as it's supposed to be. You know, uh, the coiffure of the building is uh, attempting to sing. And so are these details, you know. I mean, look here, this fragment, like, uh, you know, the, the head of, a, of an elephant, you know, incorporated in this. Are we, are we even thinking about something like this these days? No, of course not. For us, only white walls matter and space. It's majesty, the space. And of course, let's not forget the parking lot and other extremely poetical uh, things. Okay, another church, 1900, 1903, so 120 years ago. Look at this. Is it good? Yes, it is. Is it bad? No, it is not. It's a good building. It's a good building. You know, it has, uh, again, multiplicity and unity. It has these little towers, you know, gravitating around a strong center. And the, I like this conjunction between the individuality of small parts and the whole, the center. That's how, we, that's how all architecture in a way should be. Well, of course, not every building is a church. We understand that, but the spirit, the spirit should be similar. Joseph Kuipers, 120 years ago, he built it. And it is magnificent. What can we say? It's indeed built for the glory of God. Soli Deo Gloria, as Johann Sebastian Bach used to sign his musical sheets with. And maybe architects, you, the few of ones who are still here with me, you should make such beautiful plans and drawings, architectural drawings, that you can sign them with these proud initials, S. D G soli deo gloria for the glory of God alone. Can you do it? But but try to do it. You know, try to do it. Try to set for yourself this goal. Okay, I'll make such beautiful drawings and such a beautiful modeling. I will make such a beautiful building because I make it for the glory of God. I know you smile. Who would, who would think in such exalted way today? Nobody. What do you mean? What do you mean to build for the glory of God? This is uh, nonsense, you know. We build for the glory of the car. We build for the glory of the parking lot. We build for the glory of the refrigerator. We build for the glory of the toilet. We are not interested in such uh, abstractions, old fashioned abstractions. What does that mean to build for the glory of God? This is total nonsense. Please, sir, please do not tire us off with such nonsense. What is this? Another little church. Well, this, this is, uh, you know, a more down to earth church, so to speak. He builds smaller churches, bigger cathedrals, but you see colored bricks here, you know, uh, trying to sing. Yes, colored bricks can sing. 
even if they have the color of the earth, a brick is a material capable of, uh, of singing in the right hands. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said, you know, give me a brick and I'll transform it in its equivalent uh, weight in gold. He valued brick, he loved brick. brick. Big bricks are beautiful, especially if they are exposed. Don't cover them up with plaster. Uh, you know, in the name of so-called protecting them. No, you kill them. You know, bricks are beautiful if you see how they work together in building a world or whatever. You know, they, they are very beautiful and they are excellent friends, loyal friends of the architect. And look at here, all this brickwork is it, beautiful. You know, uh, the outside is less inspired in my opinion of this building, but it's okay, we saw the, the inside. Another church, again, 120 years ago, St. Laurentius. This one is interesting, almost expressionist, you know, reminds one of uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, German expressionist churches, maybe Dominicus Bern. Um, yesterday I was supposed to talk about uh, Gottfried Bern, but uh, no one showed up uh, to my presentation. So after 15 minutes of waiting, I left. Too bad. Anyway, uh, so another church by Joseph Kuipers, and look at it in the present. Not bad. Uh, you know, even the tiles on the roof, they are clay too. So, and clay is earth, and we are earth. So we should enjoy working with earth, working with clay, working with tiles, working with the beautiful ceramics of Anthony Gaudi. Fascination is the key to quality. Uh, to be honest with you, when I made this presentation, when I made the PowerPoint presentation and I included this phrase, I forgot if Joseph Kuiper said it or someone else said it, but I love this phrase, fascination is the key to quality. You know, well, the word fascination could be replaced with the word enthusiasm or the word exuberance. Indeed, you cannot create a quality work, especially in art, if you don't have fascination in you, if you are not fascinated by what you do, if you don't have pleasure, in other words, if you don't have joy, Without joy, you cannot create anything good. It's impossible. Okay, and now we go to the third architect today, uh, Rob Creer, uh, who was uh, rather famous a number of years ago when, uh, when uh, postmodernism was, uh, uh, you know, uh, the song of the day, so to speak. Let's, let's, it is his birthday today. Uh, so let's read a little bit about him. Uh, Rob Creer is a, a Luxembourgian, a Luxembourgian, Luxembourgian uh, a sculptor, architect, urban designer, and theorist. He is former professor of architecture at Vienna University of Technology in Austria. From 1993 to mid-2010, he worked in partnership with architect Christoph Kerl in a joint office based in Berlin, Germany. He's the older brother of fellow architect Leon Creer. Both are well-known representatives of new urbanism, of new classical architecture. Well, you know, uh, there is a problem with this so-called new classical architecture, because I think, you know, good works, modern works, in spirit, they can be classical without mimicking so-called being classical. And this was the problem with postmodernism. Both, both Leon Creer and Rob Creer were uh, important architects during the so called postmodernist uh, uh, movement at the end of the 20th century. But then deconstructivism came uh, upon, and, uh, you know, um, postmodernism uh, vanished. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of happy that it vanished. But there was something, you know, at the end of the 20th century, a certain nostalgia. I think human beings were afraid to step into the, into the new millennium, the third millennium. 
So they looked backwards. It was that threshold between two, uh, you know, two important uh, time periods, the 20th century and the 21st century. So, um, you know, it's probably explainable why human beings look nostalgically towards the past. Uh, now we have to find other ways to continue to build. Postmodernism in its explicit uh, forms kind of disappeared or almost disappeared, um, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, in the 20th century. Uh, so Creer studied architecture at the Technical University of Munich from 1959 to 1964. After graduating, he worked with Oswald Oswald uh, Matthias Ungers, a very important German architect in Cologne and Berlin, and Frei Otto in Berlin and Stuttgart. We celebrated, we paid homage to Frei Otto just a few days ago. Uh, from 1973 to 1975, he was an assistant in the School of Architecture at the University of Stuttgart. In 1975, he was guest professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, a famous school in Switzerland. From 1976 to 1998, he was professor of architecture at Vienna Institute, uh, University of Technology. In addition, in 1996, he was a guest professor at Yale University in the United States. But essentially, he is an artist. I mean, yes, he studied at Technical University in Munich, but if you see his architectural drawings, which are very poetical, extremely poetical in graphic terms, he's, he was also, and he is also a sculptor. So at bottom, in, in his, uh, you know, in his heart, in his, at his core, he is an artist. Uh, this is the man, Rob Creer. Uh, and uh, here is another picture of him, uh, a little bit stern and intense and tense. Uh, here he is with his uh, even more famous brother. Uh, in the foreground is Leo Creer, who is uh, still, I think, the, the favorite architect of Prince Charles. Uh, and then in the back, uh, in the background, uh, uh, but they both look quite uh, determined, don't they? Uh, Rob Creer. So Leon Creer in the front and in the back, uh, Rob Creer some drawings. And I used to, when I studied architecture, I used to love the drawings of uh, Rob Creer. And you'll probably understand why. Uh, maybe not so much here, you know, he was uh, working on, uh, you know, various typologies, urban typologies, searching for some kind of a, you know, a corner uh, building. Uh, there are books, there were, you know, magazines. His work was very published, you know, Rob Creer, Architecture and Urban uh, Design. The drawing here is by him. Uh, and, uh, you know, these drawings uh, at the end of the, of the 20th century, they influenced many people. You know, he drew uh, romantically, so to speak. Unfortunately, his built work, in my opinion, is not as as porous uh, as um, impressionist somehow as his drawings, elements of architecture, architectural design. Uh, he was very preoccupied with uh, urban schemes, as you can see here on the right. You know the the plan of a, of a city, of a town, of a town. On the left, uh, you know, perspectival drawing. Rob Creer, I think, is is important. Uh, maybe more than 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 his built work, built works, built buildings, by his drawings, because his drawings show sensuality, show the the the, the love of drawing, the draw the love of imagining, you know, cities or buildings. And I think uh, drawing is a medium which architects should uh, uh, use as creatively as creatively as possible. Uh, even if they don't have commissions, no one can stop you from drawing. And you can draw now digitally, you can draw manually. The idea is don't forget to, to, to aspire towards the essence of architecture, which is actually poetry. Because Frank Lloyd Wright was correct when he said 
a great architect is a great poet. Not necessarily that he, you know, or she writes a poem with words, but you know, the very essence of architecture at its best is poetry through bricks, through ceramic tiles, through uh, wood and steel even, and the glass and the stones, through the materials that uh, an architect works with, you can assert the, you know, the, the poetry of architecture. He didn't do this. I, I just included here, although usually I don't, I'm not a great fan of, uh, of cartoons, but someone drew this, you know, like this is Rob Creer in someone's vision. But, but here we see his drawings, you know, urban schemes on the left, uh, uh, sketch for a sculpture, and we are you are going to see uh, a few sculptures that uh, adorn, uh, you know, the, the space uh, in the vicinity of his buildings. Uh, Again, you know, he, he was and he is an artist and the sculptor and you see the sculpture on, on the right. Uh, how many architects today practice sculpture? Not many, but maybe it wouldn't be bad. After all, you know, uh, there were great architects in the past who were also good, excellent sculptors. You know, if we are to remember just Bernini, but it's not just Bernini, of course. What about Michelangelo, you know, who was the quintessential sculptor and also a, an excellent architect in his later years. And he, you know, he was not trained as an architect. He was primarily a sculptor, as you know. So again, the relationship between art and architecture is intimate, is organic and necessary. I keep saying it is necessary. Otherwise we cannot arrive at joy in architecture. No, it's impossible. It's by freeing the artistic energies within us that we can, uh, you know, aspire towards doing uh, emotional work, work that moves other people. Um, so, drawings, drawings by Rob Creer. Not afraid of color either, just like, uh, you know, uh, Anthony Gaudi with his beautiful ceramic tiles or Joseph. Uh, Quipers with his uh, colored bricks that we just saw. Now, were these uh, colors to, to be literal, uh, you know, uh, literally used uh, the way they uh, show up? No, no, no. Probably this building would not have had this yellow here, but it's okay for a visionary drawing, so to speak. Uh, it can be done. Rob Creer, Urban Space, Forward by Colin Rowe. Um, anyway, drawings, drawings, urban projects, the love of architecture, the love of art, the love of a city, the love of uh, creativity. IBA residential complex in Berlin. This was uh, in, uh, in the 80s, I think around 80, 1987. Uh, Berlin for the third time in the 20th century invited important architects to build um, blocks of flats. And they came and uh, Rob Creer was invited as well. And we are going to see his contribution to the city of Berlin. Uh, he built a few things here. Uh, they don't move me so much, architecturally speaking, maybe because of this um, uh, almost a little bit convenient uh, you know, uh, relationship with the past, with what we call tradition. Although I understand in a way, because at that time in the eighties, that's how the world is, you know, was. Uh, and uh, he, he had iconoclastic elements like here, for example, but it's, it's difficult. It's truly difficult to absorb, you know, suggestions coming from the past and at the same time to assert your time uh, you know, uh, even audaciously, if you think so. Anyway, this is the model of a building that he proposed and built actually in Berlin. And um, this is, uh, you know, you, you see he built, uh, he also incorporated sculpture, his own sculpture into the, into the body of, of his building. This is also something we should do. Why is it that we were completely divorced 
from the participation of, uh, of, of artists, you know, painters or sculptors. Why isn't the architect proposing, you know, a sculpture herself or himself, you know, if, if the impetus is there, you know, maybe this is static and it is static and somehow you could say it is aged, but, but we could even bring abstract sculpture into the into the flesh of the walls we can uh, we can use suggestions coming from even the playfulness of uh, the ceramic work by antoni gaudi the idea is don't just make straight white walls please um okay what is this and uh, it's another building he built in berlin um you know the building it is as it is i personally don't find it so great but with the adornment of the of the ivy, uh, it becomes uh, you know at least acceptable, if not more. And I keep saying, and maybe you could say I'm joking, and a little bit I am joking, but not totally. If a facade doesn't uh, get uh, you know resolved in your projects, just invite the ivy to invade the facade. I didn't yet see a building covered partially uh, or, uh, you know, in great measure by ivy, which looked bad. No, ivy, ivy, the plants climbing on the walls can make even the ugliest building a good building, aesthetically speaking, a pleasing building. I like it more with the, with the I mean, look at it, without the, without the ivy, without the plants, it's rather, you know, I mean, yes, he uses some colors there, but it's not, it's not really very convincing or, uh, you know, it's not very enticing. It's okay, I guess, with its uh, betrayed uh, symmetry, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not really a building that uh, would, would easily make you say, wow. But with the ivy, it becomes a little bit more, uh, uh, more interesting, more enticing. Yeah, look at this, you know, and uh, and uh, for the present, it's even uh, almost required to do this because uh, you know uh, we we think of uh, you know vertical forests, vertical gardens, everything vertical because we cut down the trees where they belong in the forest, and then we we want to put them on the the elevations of our buildings. So again, I, I, yes, I know I'm a little bit prov provocative, but I think you shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't agonize if uh, the facade of your building doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't uh, please you. Just, just put some, some plants wherever you feel necessary and the, and the building will be fine. Uh, so uh, look at this. Of the two facades, which one is more interesting? If we are to choose between this one and this one, I would choose this one. You know, and and yes, we can uh, fantasize that perhaps the air here is just a little bit, just a little bit cleaner than here, because these plants, you know, bring a little bit of oxygen into being that we need so badly. So. Um, Anyway, uh, these are the plans. Uh, the artist Rob Creer, uh, you know, was able to handle graphically uh, in an interesting way, perhaps uh, in a too elaborated way. But uh, uh, anyway, it, it was the end of the 20th century. It was uh, a time when uh, classical architecture became, uh, you know, attractive to architects and they found inspiration in it and so on. So the Creer era in Vienna, an evening with Rob Creer. Uh, I guess this is an interview with him. I don't know if I have here. Yeah. So the Luxembourg architect and sculptor, Rob Creer, uh, born in 1938 on June 10th, professor at Vienna University of Technology since 1976, brought a romantic variation of the postmodern discussion on urban development to Vienna with his designs based on striking imagery, studies, and publications. Creer has influenced a whole generation of architecture students 
without resorting to the creation of anything approaching a formal school. What he taught, the experiences gleaned by his former students and the lessons, lesson, lessons they learned in their time with him on the topic of this evening. This was, uh, you know, this event. A brief talk by the architect who currently lives in Berlin is followed by a panel discussion with his former fellow campaigners from his time in Vienna to bring along insufficiently appraised epoch in the history of architecture into the present. May contain traces of nostalgia. Yes, it does contain traces of nostalgia. Nostalgia is not a bad thing, especially if we think of the beautiful film by Andrei Tarkovsky called just this, Nostalgia. But nostalgia could also be an enemy because it could make you trapped into some kind of a, a dream about the past and you forget your the present and you might forget even what might follow. So Rob Creer, Vivian Das Camilo Cite Platz, um, he built this as well. Uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to think that this was built, you know, in the in the 20th century, but it was. It was, and it's possible, who knows, uh, on the spiral of time, maybe we will re reasset, um, reassess, reassess uh, the, you know, the, uh, the movement, the phenomenon called postmodernism. It's possible. Uh, but yes, there were these intermediate uh, um, eras, so to speak, or movements or subsidiary styles, or I don't know how to call them, thinking about what Patrick Schumacher uh, thought of when he divided uh, the whole modern movement into uh, various forms of modernism, uh, or the beginning with the 20, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and at the end of the 20th century, there were these deviations, these transitional um, kind of short-lived periods, postmodernism and deconstructivism. And after that, or after those, uh, Patrick Schumacher thought that, um, you know, uh, parametrics came into being with its own, uh, uh, with their own, uh, you know, subsidiary styles. And the last one in his conception was to be tecton tectonism. Anyway, Camilo Zita plus Vienna uh, in, in Vienna. Uh, the sculpture, the statue is by him as well. And uh, you, you, you recognize that it is by him because you saw some drawings that have the same spirit. Um, so, you know, architecture is beautiful if it is an adventure if it is a creation, if it is even iconoclastic, and even as Tree Hacker said rather humorously, if it is illegal. In fact, Tree Hacker, the, the good architect born in Krakow and now still living at 90 in, Krakow, in, uh, in, in Israel, he said great art or real art and real architecture cannot be totally legal. I love this. Because I think an, an architect who is supposed to be a poet and an artist, not just a, you know, a, a person of, of science, of technology, although of course architecture needs technology and needs science, um, but uh, as an artist, as a poet, as an iconoclastic uh, uh, creator, uh, could at times be uh, situated in conflictual terms with what we call the law. Although, again, I think uh, Louis Kahn was right. Man makes rules, not laws. God makes the laws. Man makes only rules, and those rules are circumstantial. So they change. A, a new government changes the rules, and we take them as laws, as if they are written in stone. They are not written in stone, for God's sake. Anyway, what is this? A house in Stuttgart, Rob Creer. Um, hey, look, at, look, look at the drawing. You know, are our drawings similar? I mean, I'm not talking about the style of architecture. I'm talking more uh, about the style of the presentation. You know, uh, using color and, uh, you know, combining uh, the figures in various ways. 
Uh, but the building is uh, is rather uh, interesting, especially especially in its built uh, appearance. Uh, you know, because the drawing is as it is, but but this one he built, and I don't think it's so bad. And there is another one, uh, Zimmer House from 1968. Uh, look at the uh, drawings by Rob Creer. You know, handmade, of course, and I'm sure he enjoyed. Uh, making these drawings very much. Uh, and the building, uh, it's rather modern, no? And abstract and uh, sharp. Um, so, you know, he, there wasn't much nostalgia here. And I think this, uh, this is a quality. The fact that he left uh, nostalgia uh, outside of the building or outside of himself, made him create a building that is um, more uh, resolutely modern and fresher, I would say. Now, this house in Luxembourg is even more interesting. Yes, it's, it connects with, uh, with the drawings we saw by him. It's essentially a cube, but um, you know there are no explicit historical uh, references here. There are no explicit uh, there is no, uh, uh, there isn't an explicit historicism, and I think the building, uh, this building, uh, stands the test of time. And uh, you know, there are complexities here that could make one uh, think of Alberti or I don't know whom. Anyway, the building towards the outside is rather almost blunt, but um, eh, also, uh, you know, from the Know, conjunction of the statue or the sculpture with the building, we uh, we get something rather rather interesting. Uh, Dickes House in, in Brida, Luxembourg, 1974-1975. I like this building actually. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, this this part, but still, you know, it's a cube. Yes, for God's sake. But he tried to create something interesting inside, you know, it was the time at that time Mario Botals was also building, you know, buildings kind of uh, a little bit, in, a little bit kind of in, in this spirit. Um, I don't know what those people in Luxembourg think of this house. It's, 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 it's a house which probably doesn't respect too much its context. Uh, but uh, so, so that's where the iconoclasm of the architect manifests itself. The plan is okay now. I, I mean, um, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm not very sure what's going on here. Um, you know, is this uh, some kind of a little studio? It's possible. It's possible. Well, I guess if you sit here, you know, and uh, I guess this is a, a bedroom, and uh, here is the master bedroom and the bathroom. It's not a big house. It's, you know, a, a moderate house in terms of size, but it has some interesting elements here. I, if we think of, you know, just the, you know, the dialogue, so to speak, between the big, uh, um, column in the corner and uh, much smaller in terms of uh, its area in section of, of, the, of the column in the center, if it is exactly in the center. Uh, I'm not sure it has a structural role, uh, but um, he placed it there, didn't he? Rob Creer. The house in Luxembourg, but you see the, 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 the this was not built quite like this, but um, you know uh, the the sculptor Rob Creer he uh, he thought of bringing in the vicinity in the proximity of the house an artwork. Nineteen seventy four. I don't know very well what's going on there. <laughs> I, it's very possible the, the, the neighbors don't like the house very much. I don't know who the neighbors are. Luxembourg is not the most uh, you know, iconoclastic country in the world. 
So um, anyway, we saw this one. We didn't see this one. Uh, But these, uh, you know, numeric um, speculations, you know, and uh, idealizations, perhaps we could bring back to architecture in some cases, at least. Although they sometimes they might um, evoke a complexity which, in fact, is not there. And what is this in the Netherlands? Uh, you know, some apartment buildings, some houses, row houses in in the Netherlands. For my taste, a little bit too passeistic, too uh, you know, statically uh, relating themselves to what we call the past. I, I'm not convinced about this. I like the bicycle, but that's about it. Um, and the bicycle was not by is not by Rob Creer. Uh, this this um, I I understand. You know, I love I love the past myself. I grew up in Sibiu. I I grew up in a you know moderately medieval town. But that's the risk with nostalgia. You know, uh, because nostalgia could uh, could uh, immob immobilize you a little bit, and uh, you know it could uh, it could make you a little bit uh, enslaved enslaved by what preceded you. I am not very convinced about this, um, you know, uh, long elevation of buildings. It's it's mimicking uh, some kind of a continuity, but that continuity is not possible today. And I think Kenzo Tange, the very important uh, Japanese architect, uh, understood this correctly. We we find inspiration in the past, but we cannot mimic in any way what the past offers us. We have to assert our time and, and these don't really do that, in my opinion. It's not, it's not sufficiently belonging to, to, to the present. Uh, and this is problematic. Uh, what is this? Uh, Bilbao, he built this building in Bilbao. Uh, I don't know exactly when, maybe the beginning of the 20th century is this is what he built. I mean, <laughs> Between these two buildings, I like more this one, and this is not by him. Yes, we pay homage to him today, it's his birthday, but this is kind of a regressive architecture. It's an architecture that, uh, in the name of situating itself on the spiral of time, is actually stuck. It's, it's not evolving, it's not dynamic enough, it's, and it's a little bit, I'm sorry, Rob Creer, a little bit pompous. And we don't need pompous architecture, do we? Um, yeah, no, no, this is not personally, I am subjective, of course, but I'm telling you what I think and feel. This is not an architecture which emulates me. It's an architecture which uh, tries to, to, you know, uh, behave, so to speak, but actually, uh, I almost said, it says a kind of a no to life. Uh, because, you know, what, what Joseph Kuipers did, he did in the, the end of the 19th century and very early 20th century. You cannot be like this 100 years later. You just can't. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, too conveniently, uh, you know, so called peaceful. And, uh, but there are some good things here, you know, like, like, like this portion of the building. But he could have transformed it more, you know, uh, uh, innovate more, you know, kind of, you know, uh, inspired by this. But it becomes too, you know, almost like a uh, historicist pastiche. And that's, in my opinion, is not good. Anyway, um, the idea to bring sculptures to the world, maybe it's not a bad idea, but bring the sculptures of, uh, bring Alexander Calder, bring a, Bring, bring the sculpture of your time, bring abstract sculpture, bring uh, the vigor, even the vigor of technology. Don't become too, uh, yeah, this is interesting in a way, these heads here, but they also seem uh, out of place somehow. You know, it's hard, it, it's true. It's a, it was a risky uh, way of, 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 uh, of assuming uh, the program of this uh, housing complex. But um, 
uh, I end now this uh, introduction in the work of uh, Rob Creer, um, rather puzzled and perhaps with some questions. In what way can we assume the past and bring the past into the present and together with it move forward? And in what way could we use art, employ art to inspire us again? Thank you and uh, happy birthday again, uh, uh, Rob Creer.